Hey, good day, dear listeners. This is Steve Prieto with the Management Blueprint Podcast. And I have with me here today, Jim Lockwood, the co-founder and CEO of the Lockwood Group, which is a professional services and solutions firm that makes the Department of Defense and other federal agencies mission ready through the delivery and application of logistics, training, enterprise, and consulting services. Jim is responsible for driving growth, creating value, and executing objectives across Lockwood's market. So welcome to the show, Jim. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to have you uh, here. And I want to start by asking about your entrepreneurial journey. How did you end up running your family's business with your father? How did you get there? Great first question, Steve. Yeah, so it really kind of reflect me back I think there's two defining moments that that um, really said this was my destiny Um, I mean one and I'd say it's not so much a defining moment one specific moment but as a kid um, you know funny enough you know business was what I most often um, played and was involved in as a child I always had and that's you know really the the underlying to my entrepreneurial journey is just the love for business. I mean I've I've just had an absolute passion for you know the aspects of business, problem solving, and that showed up again as as a child when you know I, I remember Christmas one year where my gift was an office setup. It was a briefcase, <laughs> an office setup, and that's what my parents got me. Um, and so so that kind of set the foundation for the business. And then segueing that to, you know, my college years, my college years, you know, I had um, varying um, internships like most college folks do in their college years. And I, and for some reason, I always chose the hardest ones. Um, You know, one year I was selling insurance for a summer um, as a, as a college intern. And then the year following that I decided to choose an even harder internship where I was going in and doing door to door sales. Wow. Um, for a full summer in a full suit and, in, in, you know, imagine 90, 100 degree heat. And really, I mean, what what that taught me, you know, for that those three, four months was just the perseverance and hard work um, and, and just going through that, waking up every day and, and literally was doing that six days a week. My college roommates thought I was nuts and probably partly was. Um, <laughs> but it was really the the that that learning that, you know, that I had that, that hard work and I was wired, you know, with that element of perseverance and persistence, that those data points tied to really, you know, kind of what the journey started when, when my father and I started the company, what is now 11 years ago. Okay. All right. So, uh, so you're here, you're running uh, the business uh, with your father and uh, you are in this uh, services business, professional services. So my question to you is that, was there a management blueprint or a business framework that particularly inspired you that you adopted for your business? Or it may be just a book that you, uh, you know, gleaned um, some concepts from that you, uh, you in, implanted in your business and, and it made your business uh, better. Yes. And, you know, after, after, you know, we had some, the initial discussion, I think we hit, I hit on, you know, what would say is the foundation of, of a lot of the blueprint we use, which um, comes from, you know, a long time advisor, met, personal mentor to me, um, a, a gentleman named by the name of David Kriegman. He was the, the he was an original, uh, one of the very early employees of a company called SRA. SRA was um, kind of a world beater, you know, a true innovator in the professional service space within the government back in the 80s. Um, I mean, I'm so wired on the stories just through working with them so long. Um, I know that they came, you know, they were former Air Force. They really had a, a, a real strong model around culture, you know, customer centric um, services. And, and he, you know, as an early, you know, one of the early employees, you know, was with them all the way through to COO when they went public. And then he had paid a transition and was, has been CEO of a number of other defense firms. So anyways, his book is, it's uh, zero to a billion. Um, it's, and I have it over here, 61 rules entrepreneurs need to know to grow a government contract in business. So interesting enough, um, when you go 
Google or Amazon, that term, you know, entrepreneurial rules in, in our space, there's not many titles or, you know, good titles out there. And, you know, his, his has had really good reviews. So picked it up six years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And then from that, you know, actually reached out to David and he spoke at one of our offsites and then he's been working with us since. And I mean, his book just really kind of dices out the business from, you know, the, the culture side, you know, that's that there's a whole element of culture chapter on that people side gives you the mechanics of, of sales and growth and then really the mechanics around operations and then really the last piece to it is is really the strategic and MA side of things which is a big piece of of the govcon space and in, in in how it works so mm -hmm. for sure that's that's um you know my, the management blueprint that most impacted me Okay, so there are 61 rules, uh, which is quite a lot of rules to implement. Uh, what are the most uh, important ones that you, you know, first latched on and, and you embraced in, in, uh, in the Lockwood group? Sure, so the first one, um, culture is really a part of strategy. Culture is a differentiator, um, which especially holds true in, in professional services, um, businesses. I mean, we are our, our folk, our people, and we're only the power of, of the, the, the team we build and the team we deliver to our customers. So culture and, and really spending the time to think through and develop what is our culture, which is really a, a built upon our core values. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'd say that's one very strong rule. And that's on the, that one section, the, the growth section, I'll, I'll kind of unwrap from each section just off memory. I think on the growth section, outside of the mechanics of just how to do effective sales, which, I mean, I, I think very good points in there. Um, one that he, you know, kind of holds true is, is having in your strategy that you bid four jobs that double your company every year. So mm -hmm. you, so every year you build your pipeline, you build your pipeline for the year with four jobs that can double, or, I mean, we call it game changing, mm -hmm. double or greater your company each year. And, you know, the, the logic there is you win one. So you win one, it's a successful year. So that's kind of on the gross side. On the um, op side, um, one that sticks out in my mind is that your operations um, should never grow linearly or greater than, you know, your, your, your growth on your, you know, overall revenue size. And, and, mm -hmm. You know, GovCon, I think, is unique. I mean, other professional services are some, you know, you got to be conscious of your costs. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so that's really the third one. So you have to scale your organization. You cannot just add uh, one person for, for each uh, job. You have to ratchet up the earning per person, so to say, of the, or, uh, of the organization so that you are becoming more profitable. It's a really, really big trap in professional services, especially GovCon to uh, to just you know just add bodies and make the business more complex and the profitability doesn't grow and ultimately the risk is increasing with every person okay that's a great really good one so what else any anything else that stands out yeah i mean it's always i mean the, the closing points in, in the book is just you know building with a thought on the future and even you know again govcon is one of those things where um and not to get into the details, but size and, and how you grow are, are very, it's deliberate and there's, there's gotta be a plan around it. Um, so having, you know, don't, don't be so much, you know, focused on, you know, numbers per se, but, but really be pointed at a strategy, be pointed at a vision, you know, mission readiness is really kind of where we come about it. You know, you're, you're not, and really you're not an expert at one thing, but you're really, you're, you're there to solve the problem. And it's really built upon, you know, a vision, a purpose and, and really establish the foundation of the business around that. So, um, so how is a government contracting professional services firm different from one that is serving the, the private market? Well, I mean, I think the big, the, the, one of the bigger pieces is obviously the elements of compliance that that involves delivering services and it depends and obviously the layers of compliance vary depending on the agency that you're working with now we're one of our primary customers is the department of defense 
And the Department of Defense, you know, is one of the higher tier compliance entities um, out there. So, you know, we talk about before about building your business and, and the, the operations side of things consciously. Well, you know, you also have to balance the consciousness with also building the business to, to be able to deliver and meet the requirements of your customer. So the, the levels of compliance and, and, you know, and elements just to kind of give details of just, just being very conscious of your security. I mean, obviously we're all, mm -hmm. we're all very aware of, of what's going on in, in the world of cyber. Um, I mean, really on the front end of that is, is the, the, the defense department and all entities involved in it. And then us as service providers as much, you know, or, or have to be built to, to operate in that space. And I mean, yeah, that's, that's one complexity too. And then outside of that, I mean, just from a financial perspective, I mean, I just mentioned one other area I, I'd see of the operational side that, that requires more extensive investment than I think the, the, the non-government uh, side is, you know, the financial accounting side. Because again, you're, you're not only you've got to do the mechanics of what you do in any business to, to meet the um, requirements of the IRS. But from our standpoint, you know, we're, we're audited multiple times. We're audited on that end, but we're also audited by the Department of Defense and we're audited at layers below that for each job. So, I mean, just the levels of, of complexity and, and again, it tears up, tears down, depending upon on the entity. I mean, certainly the, um, the, the level of organ, you know, how well organized and how, how you deliver your services. Again, being that you support the Department of Defense, you support, you know, lives. Um, I mean, you got you, the, the, the margin for error is, is not wide. I mean, you know, when, when we talk cost schedule, technical quality risk, I mean, it's, it's, it means there, yeah. there's height and heightenedness to it. So that's, that, that's, that's, that's that it's obvious. So, so talking about organization, uh, you mentioned on our pre-call that uh, you are organized using the IBM model. Uh, what does that mean exactly, and and why is it a good model for you? It really, what we, what we do, I mean, with that concept, is um, really breaking the business down into uh, easy, you know, digestible ways to think about. It. I mean, really, what we do as a service provider is two things. We win work, we deliver work, and then everything else supports that element of winning and delivering. Now, you know, from, from applying it to what you said from an IBM perspective, really what that looks like when we, when we, if you were to see our organization, it's built around a concept of, you know, account and customer management. Um, and whereas, you know, our, our, uh, our, our growth team, you know, is also responsible for servicing the customer where we've got it all, you know, in, in one, one area there. So it's, it's really about that element of, you know, there's not a, a separate silo of growth versus you run the project. That's all run under the same umbrella. So there, there's, there's really with that, there's accountability on the front end to what you're, how you're choosing to pursue something because you're also going to own how you, how you deliver it. Yeah. That's that's interesting. So uh, so the sales function, so to say, and the customer service function is interlinked that way. So if you saw the job, then you better make sure that you can deliver that what you sold to the customer. And and I guess the farming element and getting another job from the same customer, same department within the department may, may also be part of this. So so what does it mean mission ready? How do you get mission ready? I, I saw your website that you basically, um, you talk about the, um, you know, the, the soldiers, whether it's the arm, army or the Navy or the Marines that they get all the technology, but they also need to get, uh, you know, other stuff. They need, need to get the support packages so that they can really be mission ready. So, so what does that look like? And what kind of support packages are we talking about? Yeah, so, you know, you go to the highest levels of the, the department at the you know, defense secretary level. One of the main, one of the major metrics KPIs he's tracking at his level is, is readiness. Um, and what does readiness kind of trickle down? Um, it's really, I mean, in, in the most simplistic fashion is preparedness. Um, so from a, from a mission readiness standpoint, you know, the way we look at it and, and the way I would answer that, Steve, is it's training. Um, you know, it's, is, you know, what, is, is that soldier in the field, you know, 
well trained to do his job, you know, when he when he's there out there on on the uh, you know in the battlefield, you know, is is what he's had what he's you know the product he's using is is there a clear path to use it to to support it? I mean, re- really, it, it's all around that element of being prepared um, and and being well trained and and being you know all the all those I'd say psychological elements, but even the elements of of just obsessive planning almost. I mean, you, you could imagine the war room, the, the war rooms, literally the amount of planning that goes into things. And, and, you know, I'd say that that as much trickles down to, to our business, just, just a, a level of over preparation and, and planning and getting down to the detail level where, you know, surprises are, 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 are rare. And, and we've got a, a clear picture of, of what our risks are. And we also have a good understanding of where the, 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 the downsides may be and, and we're, and, and knowing that for our customers as well. So, so can we, can we pick a specific example? I don't know if, if you can talk about this in the abstract at all, but I would really interest, let's say you've got, um, you know, you want, you have a Navy unit and you want to deploy them in, um, I don't know, Syria, then what kind of, um, support would you be giving to this this unit would that be uh, like that that you would own uh, some part of the support and you would provide everything or you work together with a million other providers and you just provide the small slice of it sure yeah so the um the, the supply chain you know engine that supports you know, the defense department is is massive so in the example you provided um you know, and I'd use a Marine or, or Army unit because I think there's a tangible applicability there. But, you know, they're put in, put in you know, you used Kosovo. We'll use that as, as an example. Um, prior to them going over to Kosovo, they, they would have been, and this is where we come in on the front end, and, and, and I'll give you both front end and tail end. They've got to be at their home station or they've got to be at, at a training center and they've got to be on and trained on every, you know, every nuance that they're going to be using in the field. You know, they're going to be trained on, you know, how do I, you know, how do I use this radio? How do I turn it on? What happens if it breaks? You know, what happens if my signal goes down? What happens, you know, how do I use this Intel system, whatever it may be. So that's kind of on the front end. So it's an element of training. And then also with that training, as we use the word logistics up front, now logistics is a very comprehensive word. I mean, in, in the sense of of the defense department. And again, I'll use the soldier individually here. Um, logistics to them means, do I have a, a, a manual, a user guide that I can pick up that I understand that again, I'm in the middle of the, the battlefield in Kosovo or, or wherever it may be. And I, I know if this thing breaks, this thing, this thing that I have, this manual is effective and, 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 it, and it will fix my problem. Um, so, so that's kind of the home station part. And then you get into the field and the front end of things. Do things go perfectly all the time? Does the manual work? Does, I mean, it's no different than an IT department. You get the help desk ticket, right? You get the help desk t- ticket of the soldier in the field, they call on us. Um, so, so their radio's down and there's something that's not in the manual. There's something that they weren't trained on. And that's where the support on the very front end comes into play where it's really, they call it, you know, field support, you know, field service rep, Representation, representation. That's where the front end mission readiness comes. So, that, so that's, I mean, a very small sliver. I mean, there's ways we can dice mission readiness logistics in how you design a system. You could dice it mission readiness logistics. Again, I think that's more of an example when the so, when the system is being used by a user, and then you could also apply it when the system is being in the in the middle of it being fielded. So, so that's. Uh... That's really interesting. So it's basically a kind of an ultra preparedness, which you probably need in a war situation. Uh, how do you do that? Do you have checklists that have been honed for years? Uh, how do you know that you have thought about everything? What is your process there? Well, it, it's, and I think loaded could be a loaded answer, but I'll, I'll simplify it because there's so many Please. different uh, yeah, nuances to you know, the example we could use here, but we'll just use, um, we'll say a new system. And this, you know, and I think 
probably a good way to kind of segue this is mission, leading the way to mission readiness. Where did this come? Because I think that will hit on this point. Um, back when, we, you know, in 2010, 11, we were in Iraq, we were in Afghanistan fighting two different conflicts. At that time, um, obviously, the, you know, us as a country were, you know, supporting two different fronts. Um, all, all eyes from a, you know, a standpoint of the U.S. military was on defending, right? So at that point, the priority from a, from a defense perspective was to produce technology as fast as possible to solve the problem, okay? So when, when you think about that, and you think about that in any regard, right, you're developing something, you're probably developing it a little quicker than you want, you're probably not testing it as well as you want, and you're probably just putting in the user's hands quicker than, you know, you normally would. So during that time uh, in 2009, 10, when we formed the company, really was on this, this foundation as we recognized what was happening, soldiers were getting equipment. They were getting these rapidly developed, rapidly fielded systems. They didn't know how to use it. They weren't trained on it. You know, what, whatever they were using to fix it, you know, didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So from our perspective, we saw a, a, an enormous gap there and, and we really, we wanted to solve it. I mean, really with, you know, the soldier and the military mind. And I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the example I'd use from, uh, you know, from, from the question. So, so basically you were helping them to fix uh, the problems to, to learn on the fly how to operate the equipment or the systems. And you were the help desk and you were there like 24 seven supporting them every step of the way. Is this was the kind of situation? Sure, yeah. And I mean, thinking that specific example, yes. And, and I mean, since then to now, I mean, so you ask what's the playbook now? I mean, the playbook is evolving in the areas of, you know, this, single component of, of what we call logistics. And I mean, the future of this as it's already being implemented is, is all the things that you're seeing in the commercial space, you know, from, you know, uh, artificial intelligence to predict, you know, when something needs to be fixed to, you know, different elements of how they train, you know, using, you know, 3D AR, AI immersive environments. So, I mean, that's some of the playbook we've got now as we evolve to the future. But in that practical sense, we just use there. Yes, I mean, things were still very, I wouldn't call it old school, but it was, do you have your, your written manual on your tablet? And if it wasn't there, that's where we kind of dropped in and, and said, all right, well, let's think outside the box here. You know, we've got this pool of subject matter experts, you know, outside of what we have, let's figure out how to fix this. And I mean, you could use it from a traditional setting, kind of like a sophisticated help desk. I mean, that's, a, that's not a bad way to think about it. But um, you know, that's that that whole thing is evolving as 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 we move forward here. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. So as as you move forward, and you're talking about the evolution of the whole uh, process, uh, the complexity is increasing. You got all these high tech uh, things coming in all the time, and in, in the military, I guess that's a cutting edge thing, right? This is a lot of uh, new uh, innovation in in the military. So how do you even keep up with all these changes? How do you uh, stay uh, a step ahead of everyone else so that you can really uh, train them and you don't make uh, a lot of mistakes. How do you ensure that? Yeah, I think the the element you know we for as as a as an organization and, and our subject matter experts, you know, the way we close that gap, I mean, is is with partnerships with those that are on the element of of innovation. Um, you know, we've got what we. What we call an innovation hub inside uh, inside the organization. Really, what the innovation hub is doing is kind of predicting that future. Um, wh where are we going? Um, and, and I gave one example um, in my prior question. You know, one area that's changing in logistics is 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 data. Data is driving it. Um, so, what is data doing, and what are they trying to do with data? They're trying to use data to predict things. So, from our standpoint. You know, one of our core areas that we're, you know, we're working from a from an R and D standpoint and a study standpoint is around data and pr predictive analytics. Um, so, so it's it's recognizing, you know, those broader concepts. I mean, it's and and at a fundamental level, obviously, it's maintaining relationship with our customers, maintaining relationship with our customers at the user level, at the level above the user level, and then obviously at the department level, and just really understanding in a in a in a global sense. Where is you know the department going, and, and where is the nation going? I mean, there's you know the whole element. I mean, as if you read the, you can Google anything right now. It's all about near peer. 
It's about, you know, the, the bigger competitors and mm-hmm. really the strategies all around that. So from our standpoint, we've got to understand that. And then we've got to think about this, our service offering is a service offering we're delivering, keeping up with that. And, and really it's, it's multifaceted. So I'm wondering if what you do, I mean, again, the military typically is ahead of the commercial use uh, technologies in developing technologies and possibly the processes that you use are maybe also cutting edge. Um, so what is your view? How could some of those things that you are doing for the Department of Defense, other federal agencies could have uh, a commercial application in the private sector? Can you give a couple of examples that you feel like is going to go into the commercial sector and even private companies can embrace some of those kind of processes that you use for for their business? Certainly, yeah, I mean, I think not to rehash what we talked about up front, I mean, going back to the management blueprint I used, I would say the fundamentals of what, you know, that book says applies to, I mean, there's some nuanced things that are industry specific, but culture, people, I mean, I'll talk in those broad terms and I'll kind of hit the operational question. Those, I mean, we're no different than any other entity. I mean, it's, it's about our culture. It's about our core values. It's about getting, getting the best people that align to our core values. It's about promoting those core values, promoting against those core values. And then as part of that, you know, that's kind of the upfront thing is are we putting in people, people in positions to succeed? So that's kind of the element of people. And I think people in no matter what the industry is, I mean, that's, that's what's going to drive the train. So that element of it now outside, I mean, getting into the specific processes, I think from our standpoint, as we talked about, you know, the, the cost consciousness of, of delivering services and, you know, just the, you know, from a macro standpoint, I mean, the department of defense spent that one of their highest spend is on professional services. So they're always, you know, their eyes are always on, how do we drive down professional spend? So us as industry, we're always thinking, how do we deliver this service more efficiently? How do we cut our costs? So from our standpoint, I mean, we're all operating in what is now a, a hybrid environment. So we've, you know, one thing we did is we launched, you know, enterprise-wide technology um, to, to share and, and work in secure fashions and really have, you know, really eliminate what it is, those silo environments and create an enterprise. Um, and so we've, we've, we've implemented technology to do that, which, which, you know, in the past, you could walk down the hallway, right? You could walk down the hallway and you can ask a question. Well, we're, we're beyond that now. Um, and even in, you know, if you're a, a, a growing business and, and we're still, we're 11 years old, so we're still in that growing phase. So processes aren't perfect, right? So the way you get around processes often is by, again, going down the hallway and, and or in other settings. And, and I think that, so technology has been a huge thing on, on, in our backbone. I mean, it's rolling out. The, the, the element of technology and, and that's, I'd say one area that's really helped us and, and getting toward that digital, um, digital push um, is, has helped us to operate effectively that I think applies in any industry. Mm-hmm. Okay, so digital and also, I assume that you use virtual um, communication as well, much more extensively than, than before. So probably that's a big uh, cost uh, cost cutter as well. So looking ahead, what's the big vision for uh, for the Lockwood Group? Where do you see yourself ten years out as an organization? Sure, the the whole concept of of mission readiness. I mean, it's really we we thought about you know the the foundation of of that. Well, you know, in a broad sense, even when we started the organization. Mission readiness, as, as we talked about, and I think we related it just from a, a standpoint of, you know, a soldier, applies, you know, to the nation and all entities that support the nation. So if really from our standpoint, um, and going back to the vision, it's all about how, to, how do we support our nation, our, our government, our, our defense department to be mission ready. I mean, that's really what we're all about. And really, as you look at it from a practical sense, I mean, you know, we talked about in the, in the, in the prior question is we've got to beat them where they're going. So really from our standpoint, we've got to, you know, infuse elements of innovation in the organization. We have to know, you know, what is the future of, you know, this service line, that service line, we talked about logistics, you know, that's data, talk about training, 
you know, there, there's elements of, of innovation going there. So we've really got to stay ahead of the curve and, and really be, you know, the problem solver and, and be delivering that innovation to our customers. So, I mean, the five, 10 year vision is, is to keep applying what we do well, delivering that mission readiness to, you know, whatever uh, agency, be it, be it commercial or federal, is looking for that and, and, and helping them meet the moment of, of where things are going and be prepared. Okay, so wherever the uh, Department of Defense goes, you, you're gonna go, basically. Uh, your, your mission is, uh, is uh, interwoven with it, so you cannot have your own vision. It's gonna be part of the, the vision of the big picture. Okay, well, very, uh, very cool. So if, if the listeners would like to learn more about mission readiness and what you can do for them, um, where can they connect with you? Uh, what is the resource that they, you can offer them? Yeah, so directly, um, I'm like us most, LinkedIn is always a great tool. So LinkedIn is a tool that um, you know, I use professionally. So that's a great way to connect. From a business perspective, I mean, our website, we've got a longer ULL, a URL, but it's, uh, it's really the company name, the Locker Group, uh, LLC.com. Um, that's where they could find us. Um, and you know, we're, I mean, if professionally you could find us at, uh, at all major, you know, defense department and all related entity, uh, events. And we do spend a good time in the, in the, in the DC region, um, as well. Okay. Well, um, Jim Lockwood, the co-founder and CEO of the Lockwood group. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. Um, and to the listeners, uh, if you like the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcast and stay tuned. Next week, I'll have another entrepreneur sharing their exciting story with us. Thank you. And thank you, Jim. Thank you, Steve.